Welcome everybody to episode 50 of Drum Education Live. Today we have the amazing Holly Madge with us. Welcome! Yeah! It's, 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 I can't believe we're here. It's great. Um, I'm going to ask you what we ask most of our guests and that is what do you think is missing from drum education today, if anything? Uh, I feel um, drum education has definitely enhanced and progressed a lot, I think, since I remember starting to play. Um, I'm a huge uh, bastion for wanting to get more women, more visibility on women, ethnic minorities, um, just generally getting people seeing other people playing and hearing other people playing. Um, I feel like uh, a lot of kind of Western culture really overly um, focuses on uh, white players, mainly male, um, though they are fantastic and we can all learn a lot from them. I do think the broader spectrum um, could afford to be highlighted perhaps a bit more. Um, I feel that seeing is believing. Um, and I felt it even when I was on a conference call with um, some of the other judges from Hit Like a Girl contest, I suddenly just went, oh, wow, this, this is a whole thing. All these other people feel the same feelings that I do. And I was just validated in a way I hadn't really imagined. So if that happens to me, and I've been in the industry for 10 years, how great would it be if you could sow that seed of um, validity from the word go when, when people start out? F female or male, anyone really. Hmm. Yeah, I think Great that would answer. be amazing. Well, keep going, Kira. <laughs> I know you. you have a list of 500 million questions. So. Sorry, I do. <laughs> I would like to know a bit more about where this all started for you and how old you were when you started drumming and why drums? <laughs> I was 10 um, I, and the school needed a drummer for Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. <laughs> so it was really <laughs> hard. <laughs> Actually, at one point, my uh i needed to fill in on sax i was already playing clarinet so i thought oh why not let's just do a bit of sax while we're at it while we're doing drums as well and my mum actually filled in on drums for me for a bit which is pretty cool oh my god that's <laughs> so cool so, um, so yeah it was um though my family weren't enormously musical they loved music um my mum played a bit of piano growing up um and dad's always loved drums so um, I was just really lucky when I was 10 that someone had a, a drum kit in Devon in a barn, you know, classic cliche. Um, and they're like, oh, go on, have a go. Um, and I just loved it. I just thought it was the best imaginable. It was so empowering. Um, and when we got into the nitty gritty of um, reading music, I found it was almost like code breaking. And having grown up really being a bit of a mass geek, that totally appealed to me. Um, so yeah i think that for me uh age 10 was an amazing uh time to explore drums and move on from there um so yeah that's how i began and then went to southampton university did a music degree there which i loved it wasn't a performance conservatoire i wanted to study um musicology and how music was in society um and oh, a bit cool. of well. so for me that was a really wonderfully broad course um that gave me which kind of armed me with a good breadth for, for adult life as a musician, really. Um, yeah, and then I've been playing live in session ever since. Cool. Amazing. Yeah. Your CV is just amazing. It's incredible. Hans Zimmer, uh, Idris Elba, Frank Turner. There's, 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 there's a whole, whole, whole big list. <laughs> um, but do you remember your, your first ever gig? That's a great question. Wow. No. I think we'll be through fear. To be honest, I'll Come on. that first. Come on, Kira. With that, with that resume, why would she remember her first ever gig? I remember, I remember my first ever gig because I've never played with these kind of people. So I remember it, but you know. Um, the, um, well, I guess the first gig was that Joseph and Technical Dreamcoat, age 10. <laughs> so, there you go. You remember? <laughs> I think a lot of my gigs early days, I was quite lucky that my mum used to take me to jam sessions. Um, oh. And uh, I distinctly remember she'd go and get me a pack of salt and vinegar crisps and half a pint of Coke. And that was to last me the night. 
And I would go to these jam sessions with all these guys who very kindly let me get involved, given that I was, what, 13 or whatever. Um, and I could go and jam Jimi Hendrix with them. I could jam jazz stuff with them. And slowly that became uh, a very regular part of my musical education. And actually going back to your question about musical education, I think that is another key thing that perhaps would be um, wonderful for kids is to make sure that mandatory, if you're taking drum lessons or you're taking any other band instrument lessons, um, to be part of a band as you're going. So, you know, yes, of course, have a year of learning the basics, or whatever, but then really grow that creativity, grow that musicianship, working with other people. Um, I think that for me was enormously formative when I was in my teenage years and really helped me forge into the, a space where by the time I got to an adult uh, professional musician, I'd already had 10, 15 years of, well, 10 years, I'm not gonna age myself, 10 years of, <laughs> of really getting to, how to work with different people in different styles of music, because let's face it, different genres require completely different roles within drums. Um, and, and different people that you meet in those different genres. Um, so uh, yeah, I think for me, the first gigs that really uh, resonated with me were those jam sessions past yeah. June Coke. That was, um, that's where I really feel like I've cut my teeth and would recommend to everyone that plays. Did you have right formal advice. drum lessons? Yes, I did. I had some great teachers. Um, I had a mixture actually of teachers. Um, uh, some were more orchestral uh, led and then I had an amazing guy called Colin Bellworthy who to my knowledge is still teaching in Devon. It was all about the groove and the feel and um, I owe him a lot. And I had some wonderful other teachers as well um, as I went into uni and past that. But um, I've always been lucky enough to have formal teaching um, and then blend that in with, you know, informal band sessions and um, environments like that. I feel like both are incredibly important. Having said that, I haven't had a formal drum lesson now for what well, I'd, I'd be embarrassed to tell you. I reckon it's probably got to be about five or six years. And I could really do with getting back to it, getting someone drilling some some uh, discipline back into me again. <laughs> <laughs> what would you want to work on? What kind of thing? What I'm like interested to know your your goals for your you're playing and so if you did decide to go back to it what would you focus on um i found i don't know about you guys but when i was at uni i was playing every second of every day i was exposed to loads of different types of music um financial kind of uh considerations had absolutely nothing to do with the type of genres i played or the type of gigs i played so i was open to a real broad range of music um, which I don't feel like I'm exposed to as much now. Um, now, when I'm doing session work or uh, I'm gigging, quite often there is a very set set list to learn. Um, and though you can use your artistic license, there are of course boundaries. Whereas when we were at uni, <laughs> there were zero boundaries, <laughs> and it was fantastic for um, exploring new things. Um, so I quite like to go back to having someone pick my playing apart. Um, in a way that I don't think people do so much when you're an adult player, I think. But but would you like to go uh, like musical styles or drum technique? Oh, I see. Um, both, both. I think there's a lot of Latin music that I'd really like to explore further, um, which I would like to have a teacher who's really knowledgeable in those areas. Um, and technique wise, I'm sure my technique isn't perfect. Um, I'd love someone to perhaps make my playing more efficient. I think I've no doubt I've got into bad habits over the last 10 years. You know, if you spend six months doing a tour with hands, which is entirely, you know, um, hand played percussion and electric pad, your feet are gonna suffer. So if there's someone that can help me get back into having, you know, fit feet for one of a better, <laughs> you know, efficient feet, um, Happy feet. Yeah, exactly. Happy feet. Um, they make me happy because they're perfectly on the money. Um, you know, things like it's almost like a bit of um, physio almost, you know, that rehab, getting your body back into um, 
shape again and obviously I can do that to some extent myself and you know I feel much more comfortable within three months of being back from tour I felt more comfortable about my feet again but um but I do think there's there's always something that someone can teach you and I'm so up for people picking apart my playing and and improving I get really sick of that kind of politeness that comes with being a professional musician and the way that everyone's like, oh, that was a great gig and really what they want to say is we could have probably worked on that section better or that felt amazing can we do that should we go over that next you know people just I find that sometimes in certain groups of people people aren't as honest and as cutting as we were at university to each other when we sat in our performance lectures probably because they might think if i say she's not playing that well when she needs a guitarist or a bass player she's not going to call me but i don't know um you know we've all been in bands no doubt and that feeling when you're in a band with people who you're all there for the music's sake first and foremost it's nothing to do with career progression so when you're in a band, it's like you're all a family and you squabble over stuff. Like, I remember being in a band called Melonious Funk and it was one of the highlights of my career, both that one and then um, the correspondence which I've worked with um, oh, yeah. in my 20s, which I had the time in my life working with them. Um, you know, in all of those situations, everyone's so passionate about the music. Everyone pitches in and it's never seen as um, an insult to you if someone says, oh, why don't we suggest that? Let's do that a bit different. or um, we can work on that. Let's make that tighter. Let's run it seven times. You know, and I remember being in rehearsal when I was 16 with my bandmates. And I think we had like a full blown argument about how to finish this song. And <laughs> it was fine because we just played it, worked out the answer and there it was. But, you know, everyone was so passionate and so open and honest that I think we got so much more out of that for just, you know, airing ideas, trying a few bits and then, you know, there you go. There's an efficient way to get to the answer. It took, what, 10, 15 minutes of our life and we've got a far better song for it. So, mm. yeah, I'll always be one to advocate a bit of extra openness. Yeah, that, that is good. And who would, you, who would be your dream teacher? Oh, my God. If, That's if, you, if you could question. choose anyone in the world to have half a dozen lessons. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> can I split it up? Can I have a couple with each? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, Buddy Rich, I would love to have so many lessons from Buddy Rich and a lesson about uh, Big Band Feel. Um, I would love to have uh, a lesson with Steve Gadd, again, about feel and simplicity and space. Um, and just hear his thoughts, because I feel like we so often hear his playing um, and there's so much wonderful space there. Obviously, he knows exactly what he's doing, um, but I would like to hear him vocalise that as, as we went through maybe working on some bits of music. Um, and then it's not really necessarily a drum lesson, but I would love to speak to whoever engineers Carter Bofa's drum kit, because I want to know how he makes it sound that <laughs> makes Whoever well, it is, they make that sound unbelievable. <laughs> one, thing I, one thing I can tell you is like probably 50% of that sound is Carter himself. Yeah, yeah, you very know? true. You know. All right, one lesson with him, one with his engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and well, of of these three names, the only one that's impossible, it's Buddy Rich. Every the other two, they're still alive. Yeah, true. I like your optimism. Good aim for it. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we love Felipe. He's like, go on, just what? ask. Just 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 try. Well, why not? Oh, so many questions, so little time. Um, could you tell us a little bit about um, the Hans Zimmer gig and how that came about and what that's been like for you? Um, it's been nuts. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, it started with just two live shows at the Hammersmith Apollo, which um, came about many years ago. I think it was 2015, 2016, 15, I think. Wow. Um, and they were just two shows. As far as we were concerned, it was six percussionists um, and we were in for two shows and that's all we knew. Um, what we didn't realise at the time is that was actually a pilot for a tour. Um, and Lucy and I uh, were very grateful to be invited on the first tour, which was a European tour. That was then followed by a world tour, um, which was five months away, solidly, which is nuts. Um, 
And then ever since we've been doing, we did some gigs in Singapore and in South Korea, which were amazing. Um, and next year, it looks like tours hopefully going to be uh, February to April 2020 um, sure. with a new show, which is very exciting. Um, but that's all I know about that bit so far. But what I know about what we've already done is that it was one of the best experiences of my life. Um, every member of that band is exquisite both musically and personally. They're some of the kindest, um, most, I don't know, most creative people um, and people that are full of fun as well. Like what makes that tool so special? And Hans talks about it a lot, about playfulness and this ability to keep things fresh and childlike. And you feel that within the brand. There's a real vitality to the band um, and amazing communication on stage between everyone. Uh, you know, within the music and also just as, as wonderful people. Um, Hans is extraordinary to work with. He is um, a, one of the kindest people I've ever met and the most thoughtful people. Um, and the band is just colossal. And behind me is the horn section for the orchestra. So I'm having the time of my life. I'm literally in the middle of Hans' arrangement, like physically standing in the middle of it, which is such a special place to be. Um, you just learn so much off all of these players and Nick's an amazing MD and Satnam's a sick drummer and changes it up every night. So yeah, and I'm really lucky to have Aisha by my side um, who is an incredible musician and a wicked percussionist with incredible feel. Um, so we just have the best time. It's super great to be there. Um, uh, and now being a little bit geeky about it, uh, you said that the, the drummer changes a little bit every night or a lot I don't you know is there room for improvisation or it's pretty much this is what you have to play every night so there is an element there's very much framework to work to um a lot of these pieces are really epic as well so they've got their own shape and their own direction also they're incredibly close to a lot of people's hearts so there is that to consider as well <laughs> but this is the live show so we kind of um build it to another level um, and to an experience that you won't get on any other tour. I mean, it's just those arrangements and watching the audience's reactions are just insane. Um, so there very much is kind of a set precedent to some extent, but past that, yes, absolutely. There's elements to um, work around each other. There's an element of freedom. Hans, for sure, is always listening to what's going on within the band, um, changes bits up, um, has got an appetite for Satnam's ability to play he honestly it's just amazing I don't know how we can do over 100 shows and each night something fresh turns up and he's playing it's fantastic for us our role is to a point quite set um because a lot of the sounds that we're using on our SPDX are sounds from the movies from the scores so you know there is an element of that really needs has its place generally speaking um, but we do also play djembe, so there's very much a conversation element between Aisha and myself and Yolanda, who's on bass, who's just groove master of the world, um, and Satnam. So between us, there very much is an element of conversation there. Um, Pedro is also an incredible player. The, the, he, well, he just plays everything, but um, primarily in the show, he plays a lot of uh, flutes and uh, woodwind instruments. Um, so, but he also is a percussionist as well. So you get this wonderful playoff between him playing quite uh, rhythmic floor, uh, flute lines and us, and that's wonderful too. So all round, we're incredibly lucky um, to have such a good team. And Alexander has joined us in the last year. He's a sick percussionist. Um, so yeah, there's, there's plenty of scope in there. Cool. Within the realms of the structure. Very yeah. cool. Um, I was going to ask you about um, your uh, Sail Away uh, dress yeah. company because yeah. beautiful, lovely dresses. Yeah. And um, my first thing thoughts are like, well, how the heck do you keep that going when you're on <laughs> tour? Like, <laughs> how? How? We did have one period where we were recording the soundtrack for the new Lion King movie and it just coincided with a whole load, a bunch of events for Sailor Wayne. It was like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? 
but I've been incredibly lucky. I started Sail Away hmm, five or six years ago now. Um, and over the years, we've um, got to know some really incredible staff. Um, those are all people who uh, are complete self-starters, um, all very practically minded, but also incredibly creative. So, and wonderfully sociable people. So I felt incredibly comfortable leaving everything in their hands um, to run these kind of festival, um, well, yeah, festival stalls, basically, festival boutiques for us. Um, mm. So yeah, I mean, there there is sometimes an element, you'd be on a tour bus and you're kind of like uploading the new dresses on the tour bus, hoping <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, and there has been a few moments where, uh, well, I mean, a number of the members of the band uh, do rock sail away. So I'm really lucky that there's a wonderful little crossover there. Um, uh, yeah, the girls are really awesome. And even hands. I don't have any pictures of it that I can show. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> awesome. So, so, yeah, so that's that's all a bit of fun. But, yeah, I, I think... Uh, I'm very lucky that everyone's kind of greeted it with um, with a positive stretch rather than being like, oh, that must mean you're a, a lower quality musician to be able to have time to do that, if that makes sense. Like, that would be a very easy assumption. And I just think I've been lucky that everyone's been so, um, they've embraced it so much. So, mm. yeah, it, and for me, I think it's nice to have a break uh, from music and have something else to channel your energies into and have different kind of social groups so when you come back to music you're actually refreshed and looking forward to doing it rather than just kind of stuck in something constantly and yeah, and I, sure. I'm, I'm pretty sure that one thing feeds from the other you know yeah exactly you know you're so right it's nuts the amount of um contacts through sail away that have helped music and the amount of contacts in music that have uh really elevated sail away to new levels i mean i've got some gorgeous pictures from um uh, what was it? Uh, City Musical in um, in New York, and we are on stage in sailor way dresses, and it's just one of those wonderful moments. Or like, I did another gig with um, some girls from a group called High on Heels, which is um, all electronic music and DJs, um, and I've got a picture of four of those girls walking down the uh, Formula One track in Monaco in their dresses it's just you know it's yes. lovely yes no i'm really lucky really lucky oh i'm sure you know there's a lot of hard work behind all that luck you know <laughs> oh, <right>. sometimes <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna keep going um yeah, you <laughs> okay um i want to talk a little bit about um you were talking about being visible um as a female musician and ethnic minorities and and rightly so. And I just wanted to know your experiences and if you have had any times where you've had some discrimination or or anything like that being a happening to be a, a drummer who's female. <laughs> it's really interesting you bring it up. I was I've been thinking about it for a while, thinking about writing an article about it, because I still find it quite hard to vocalise my point in a way that um uh is as balanced as I want to be about it. You know, I'm I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunities I've had. Um, some of those are entirely music based. Others have no doubt come from the fact that I'm a female. And I think the industry that we're in, we need to accept the fact that right now, and certainly for the last 10 years, being a female is a novelty and it definitely works in your favor to some extent, favor with some gigs. However, that also comes with a bit of a footnote of like, but make sure you look all right. And, you know, you put the effort into how you appear and make sure you can prove yourself. And, you know, that that kind of barrier to entry is basically the gig comes with a lot of assumptions or um, extra ways in which I feel I, I've had to prove myself. And that said, it can also work against you. And I think probably I, could, well, I don't know, everyone's different, but perhaps here you had these moments where, you know, uh, people perhaps approach you with a bit of scepticism. And it's the same across the board with lots of um, environments where females are the minority doing it. It's just, it's a strange thing to see. So naturally you do feel like, oh good, there's a woman doing that. And, you know, the natural kind of 
oh maybe they're not strong enough maybe you know it does feed in and it's it's not I don't think it's anyone's fault I think it's just how it has progressed over time and then it gets picked up into a commercial environment and then that then gets um uh what's the word I'm looking for that then gets kind of exasperated and, and really pushed out there to everyone via music videos or via you know gigs with record labels or you know it really just gets expanded and elevated um to a new level and I think it's going to take a little bit of undoing to get that out of popular culture um I just I it's a very it's a it's an interesting subject and it's one I haven't really managed to get a nice articulate answer to because I don't want to be ungrateful for the opportunities I've got I definitely don't want to appear to have a chip on my shoulder um I know how lucky I've been. I know how being a female has landed me in positions that many of my male colleagues wouldn't have landed in so quickly. It's a bit snakes and laddery. You know, you mm. kind of go along a bit and then someone goes, oh, we should get a girl on this. And you're like, oh my God, can you just get a drummer and just want me for being a drummer? You know, and and I think it's very hard because that, that, um, that notion and uh, that kind of rhetoric just immediately degrades you and makes you feel, mm. oh, well, they want a girl. So, and I think it's a hard barrier to try and break through. I think we start our careers in a corner and we've got to try and get out of that corner, um, but do it in a, you know, a way that doesn't appear to have a chip on your shoulder. I don't, I don't know. I'm really struggling to find. But I, I know, I'm not, I know I'm not the best person to comment on this, but, uh, don't you think that you could use that on the advantage of thinking I can inspire a girl who's going to watch the gig and wow, I want to play the drums as well. Totally. And I think that is a brilliantly positive way to look at it and the most um, constructive way to look at it. You know, it's, we are given these platforms um, and for whatever reason that someone has given that platform and let's, and to be fair, I'd like to say that um, I'd like to bring in the fact that growing up, a lot of people did treat me with complete equality and I've never felt um, necessarily locked out, but I have often felt like I need to prove myself more um, than perhaps my male counterparts um, to be in certain situations. I've got a lot of people that I can thank a million times over for bringing me up as an equal uh, Devon Music service, service all the way through university and a lot of my adult life. but. I think you're right when you've got those opportunities you've got to make the most of them and you've got to use them as a platform to show hey look here we are and you know i'm not just here because i'm a girl i'm here because this is how i play this is what i'm about um and whatever that person that put me here thinks i've still got a voice you know i'm the one on the yeah. stage i'm the one playing to you so you know, here we are, this is what I have to offer to you. And I think you're absolutely right. That brings a validation for a lot of other people. And, you know, I don't know whether it inspires, but it probably at least leaves people going, oh, I'd either like to do it like that or I'd do it differently, but it makes them think and perhaps provokes action, perhaps. Because the, the, way, I, because the way I see it, when, when I started playing one million years ago, uh, there were very, very, very few women playing the drums. And usually yeah. when, when girls went to their parents and said, oh, I wanted to learn to, to drums, the first, the first answer was, oh, no, that's not a, in, an instrument for a girl to play. <laughs> yeah, you I know? think you're right. Yeah, it's filtered. It's, it's really changing from every... Uh, every part of the system, everything that feeds in to what results as a female drummer or, or anyone that um, recognises themselves as female, I feel like that, that uh, filter before they get to actually being the drummer is changing enormously. And I think it is becoming far more um, open. I know certainly growing up, I didn't really see many other female drummers. I remember doing, you know, did we do the Robin gig together? Yeah, I think that's how we met. Yeah, I remember that <laughs> and I remember coming home just buzzing because I was like, I have never in my whole career seen more than one other female drummer in one place at one time. And here we all were for this awesome gig at Radio One's big weekend with Robin. And, and it was such a great vibe between everyone. 
And I thought, that just felt incredible. And it was so powerful. And I thought, God, okay, I've waited till I'm, what, 21 for that? What happens if those drummers that are 10 have that feeling and have Mm. that, you know, sisterhood's a bit of a a cheesy word, I feel, but like, you know, have that that connection between everyone and that support. and yeah, I think I think the future is incredibly exciting, and I'm petrified. I'm not going to have a job in ten years. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to worry about that. No way. No. You can always put the Hans Zimmer card. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we'll try. Yeah, I'm just gonna. Yeah, it's just it's a. Uh, it's an exciting time to be a drummer for sure and things are changing and uh stereotypes are disappearing and mm-hmm. um, what a wonderful time to be in the middle of it all oh so nice um i'm gonna i'm gonna t- i'm gonna take it to another place um with corona and oh. how have you have you been has it made you rethink any area of your life at all lay it on us uh, yeah 100 percent um i think i'll start by saying i think i've had it incredibly easy compared to a lot of people so um uh when i talk about my difficulties please don't think that i think they're um they're particularly important in the grand scheme of things but from my personal experience um we we actually we've always been based between we've had this kind of tussle between Cornwall and London. All the work is in London. Heart is in Cornwall. I grew up in Devon. Um, we were lucky enough to buy a house down in Cornwall um, through odd circumstances a few years ago. So that's always been where my heart lies. So it's always been a bit of a tussle. But come March last year, we were like, this is really strange. The gigs are disappearing all of a sudden. Never happened like this before. Lose my my uh, husband works for Red Bull, so his events started falling through. We're like, well, this is really strange. So we ended up going, you know what? Let's take a break down to Cornwall for a bit. If this is going to be the case for a while, let's take a break. And then about a week later, Corona suddenly kind of reared its head, and it all made a bit more sense. Um, so we moved out of our London flat without even realizing that we were moving out of it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so that was quite crazy. Um, and then since being back in Cornwall uh, during the first lockdown, I was lucky enough to find a uh, space at my old, where my studio used to be, um, which is on this industrial estate in Newquay. And um, I managed to find a unit that was available and the guys there were absolutely amazing. Obviously given COVID, everything was shut, but they just left the keys for me and said, there you go. You know, we can't get involved but here's your studio. Luckily, there's a screw fix 100 yards from here. And I was able to buy everything online and collect remotely and just build myself a studio. So the first lockdown was just me and a screwdriver and a saw. (laughs) And and, uh, I was lucky enough, I had a few friends down here that have worked in sound before, so they could kind of give me advice from afar. Um, The community down here is incredible and I was grateful to be here. So, uh, they kind of really helped me um and the general vibe down here was fantastic you know the, the cafe started doing takeaway services and um everyone kind of just pulled together and uh helped out with everyone else whenever they needed it so that was amazing um and long and short of it i ended up really working hard in the studio using some of the money from the self-employed grant that i was lucky enough to have to buy some studio gear and i don't know about whether you guys ever find this but when I go into sessions, it's all like, go, go, go. Right, okay, there you go, do it. Don't mess it up. Here we go. One, two, three, three, three done. Bah, out. <laughs> and you never really get the chance to sit down and soak it all up and listen through stuff really carefully with a little nip. You get really geeky over it. Mm. I've been craving that for years and I never realised it. So this space is my place to really indulge and be vulnerable and creative. And no one else comes in here apart from if I would teach someone in the future um, in here, then then that would be the only time they're coming in or people that I collaborate with. But apart from that, it's my safe space. And I haven't had that the whole time I've lived in London. So what a treat. <laughs> so yeah, gig wise, no gigs, 
uh, obviously. Big change, big routine change. Um, but I feel healthier for it, for sure. And I think I'll really think about how I get back into work again and what I say yes to and being mindful that, you know, my husband and my dog are in Cornwall. And that's a life that I've realised this last year is really um, precious. So, so yeah, and this studio is somewhere that over this time, if I've had any down days or days where I felt completely overwhelmed, and um, goodness, haven't we all had a few of those, um, this has been my my saviour, really. So I don't want to avoid that. I want to, you know, really keep that and cherish it as part of my routine, I think, hopefully. I say this now, and then I'll, <laughs> financially speaking, I'll have to get back to some more of self <laughs> Uh, you know, it all sounds good, doesn't it, until the reality happens. Um, that's certainly my intention. Cool. Well, congrats, because that looks like a really lovely space. And I think that's awesome that you've turned something, you know, so negative this this time and you've turned it around and created a lovely space for yourself. Maybe we'll end with what would you say to your younger self? Oh, my God. <laughs> Stay true. <laughs> that you love. Stay geeky, stay inquisitive, don't be inhibited by all the BS that comes with the music industry. Um, and just know that you'll find the people that love your playing and who you are and what you stand for as musically. Um, you'll find them and you don't need to mould yourself too much. Just stick with it. Keep that path. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank that, you guys. That was great. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. And that was just some beautiful answers. It's lovely. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Sorry, I waffle a lot. So please edit. <laughs> oh, we love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, I don't know what the original question was. <laughs> <laughs> who, who cares about your original question? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> Say it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for having me. I feel really, really honoured. It's such an amazing thing that you guys run and 